Today, Ed, instead of Matt, I appreciate that. <coughs> okay, so the two, the two questions that come out of this seminar, um, the other one is on media, but the two questions that come out of this, uh, this particular lecture that feed into the seminar that you'll have uh, <coughs> next is question one, is a lack of political participation problematic? And then question two, can interest parties replace political parties? Um, so, I'll tell you my positions on those two questions, and then I will enact those for you um, in the course of this lecture. Um, so, my position as regards uh, political participation, I'll just give you a bit of background. So, I, I asked to do this lecture, um, and there's a good reason that I asked to do this lecture, and it really has to do with more the political participation side than the, uh, than the pressure group side, although that's interesting to me too. But it's really question one that, that motivated me, if you like, to want to do this lecture. So when I did A-level politics, um, I was taught in Dirtling Cornwall, um, uh, based Truro College, if anybody knows Truro. So I was taught by um, a, a very cool guy, who was sort of about my height, quite, quite skinny, muscly, moved to Cornwall to do surfing and all this stuff. But he was from London. Uh, he was a proper sort of died in the wall Marxist, right? Um, so I, I, or a Marxist that defined himself as a Marxist in opposition to Thatcher in the 80s. Um, and he was a great teacher. He was really, really good. But the, the one thing that I always found him a bit shaky on um, was this issue of declining voter rates. Um, and I just wanted to say that it's actually not a bad rule of thumb when you're studying, you know, this is the kind of tension, right, that you may not get into in some other kind of disciplinary area. That when you're studying politics, it's not always a bad rule of thumb to... <laughs> As you move through a course, so say as you move through this degree program that you're in now, or maybe you go on to further ways of study, modes of study and stuff, that you, in some sense you're forced to, right? You're forced to specialise, but as you go forward, you then, you know, maybe to master's degree or whatever, then you're picking what you, uh, you want to do. And it's not always a bad rule of thumb to listen to the people that are teaching you and listen to the points at which uh, they quiver, if you like. When they, when they might be talking about a particular issue. So find a, find a chink in their armour, in the sense that um, something that they kind of explain for themselves and for others, but they don't really explain, right? That there's some sort of unresolved tension in them. And the reason I tell this story is because the guy that taught me A-level politics, he was great on everything, apart from I found him shaky on the, the idea of uh, voter rates, right? Um, and I always thought that his position, which was a, a, the, the, the position that declining voter rates in the West uh, constituted a kind of nightmare, right? That this, in, in, a, in the kind of sense that they would have talked, someone like Marx would have talked about it in the 19th century, that a, a, literally a nightmare. That if you have declining voter rates to the extent that I'll show you on some graphs, then that constitutes effectively the worst thing that can happen politically. That, that, that all other problems, or most other problems, come as a consequence of low voter turnout. And so my position on this is that um, a lack of, if we define political participation only as voting, then my position is that that's not problematic, right? And I'll, I'll tell you why. So my position is that um, we're effectively all children of the 18th century, right, in various ways. Uh, in two crucial senses. So, sense number one, um, rising populations, right? So, if you know something about early modern times, you know that uh, birth rates were kind of stabilised in various ways, cleanliness. And the 18th century is when the fruits of that are borne out um, and populations start to rise. <coughs> Coming number two in train with that is urbanisation, right? And although I won't go into the specifics, my my contention, the thing that I want to uphold, is that the 18th century, these two trains, these two developmental trains, if you like, of um, rising populations and urbanisation, that what that really did, in the sense that we're all children of the 18th century, that that provided us, all of us here today, and your parents and your grandparents and their parents and their parents, 
that the, these two developments of rising populations and urbanization, it really provided everyone with a menu, if you like, a, a very wide menu of ways in which you can participate uh, politically, right? And voting was very important, but it wasn't the only thing, and that's crucial. So the, the 18th century guys, what did they know? The 18th century guys, I showed some of our seminar groups um, like a, a painting of the, like the Federalist, um, the, the American Federalists, right? The people that came up with the American Constitution. And they're all there in their wigs and they're all there at their, their sort of mahogany desks and all this. And they knew that there was nothing democratic about um, what you might call applied forms of competence, right? So being good at something. <coughs> that you can then take into, they didn't call it the private sector then, it really, everything was the private sector, right, apart from religion, that applied forms of competence, being good at something, that there's nothing, they knew this, right, that there's nothing democratic about uh, competence and applying it, being useful in the world. Um, and I suppose my contention is that if people aren't voting, then they are nevertheless finding ways in which they can be useful in the world. And this is, um, this is a path that many of you will bear out, right? That, that, that you may not vote, but you will be finding ways in which to be useful. You'll be rewarded for that, which allows you to continue and so on. So this is my point, that there's a, there's a wide spectrum um, of possible ways of participation that we need to be aware of. And then my point as regards um, interest parties is a little bit more pedestrian, right? So if your question is, um, can interest parties replace political parties, then um, my, my answer, a little bit more pedestrian, it would be something like, yes, maybe, but not completely, right? So that kind of applied competence that has nothing to do with voting, which is a way of gaining um, a way to participate. The, if you like this with a French accent, it would be um, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, right? The French uh, 20th century uh, uh, sociologist who talked about social capital. So social capital can, and applied forms of competence can spill out into interest groups and doing politics that way. But my point is no, that interest groups can't replace uh, either political parties or traditional politics as such, not completely. Um, that you're always going to need to rely on some kind of dominant model uh, for understanding politics. And I'll tell you a bit about what the dominance model is. Okay, so let's get on to the slides. Okay, so um, it feeds into what I've just talked about really, but if you define political participation as citizens or people, however defined, Aiming to influence the decision-making process. And the point that I'm going to hammer home with some um, deliberately harrowing images is that it may not seem it to, to everyone here all of the time, or maybe even any of the time, right? Which reflects the fact that we live in a very, not a safe society, but a safer society perhaps than other people in the world do right now, or other people at different times in history have. So my point is that decision-making process, you want to be on the right end of that, right? It may not seem to anyone here like there's massive consequences attached to being on the wrong end of it, but I suggest that there is. Um, we've got some videos here of uh, Thatcher and Tony Benn uh, talking about this issue. Um, I'm not gonna play them because save us time to be honest. But so, if you go on, the, go on the slides, which will be uploaded to learn, um, so the special interest one will take you to Thatcher. So I'll just boot it up just to show you <coughs> what it looks like on its face. This year, as before in our history. So it's actually um, halfway through that it gets interesting. Right? And Thatcher talks about, she's um, uh, 283 days into the miners' strike, 1984 to 1985. <laughs> Um, and Thatcher talks about the, um, the necessity to, well, maybe I'll let Thatcher say it for herself. I represent the whole union. 
As some of the tactics they use are to hold meetings and very short notice in places not advertised, and they somehow take over. You get the same thing sometimes in students' unions, uh, where those who are keenest on work can't go to meetings and stay on and on and on and on and on, and then find uh, that the boat isn't taken until there are only a few left, and those are the fanatics. This, I'm afraid, has become almost a standard tactic. There you go, so fanatics, right? So Thatcher's worried about fanatics um, that are over-determining the political process. Then on the other side, you've got Tony Benn. I will play this, because this is nice and short. But very loud. Hang on. Throughout the history of the world, the rich and powerful have dominated it. And very few people have had any control of their own governments. On my order, <coughs> Coalition forces have begun striking selected targets. On Tuesday night, I gave the order for British forces to take part in military action. This is the story of the attempt to change that, to win the power for the people as a whole. It's the story of a great idea of democracy. And the struggle to make this idea a reality has often been bitter <coughs> and bloody. After 50 years in Parliament and 11 as a cabinet minister, I've had some experience of democracy, the limits to it, and the threats to it. And <coughs> all the power that I ever had, I got from those who voted for me. So, um, two people who are sworn enemies, and um, Ben's talking a little bit later after the fact, but two people who are sworn enemies absolutely hated each other. They both did believe in uh, people voting for different reasons. So Tony Benn talks about democracy as uh, a process whereby power is transferred from the wallet to the ballot. So they do both believe in uh, voting as a way to maintain uh, control over the decision-making pro uh, process, but they think about it in different ways. They prioritise different things. So. Uh, I've collected some images of people who were on the wrong side of the decision-making process. So this is two children that were caught up in the uh, Syrian civil war, uh, 2011 to, well, it's still ongoing. This was the more famous image. The Jews, World War II, represented here by the shoes that they left behind. <coughs> And these images, um, that's deliberately chosen to be harrowing, that these images relate to um, a, an incident that you might not have heard about from 1984 called, so this was, um, these were victims of a gas leak, right, in the central Indian city of Bhopal, so B-H-O-P-A-L, early December 1984, and it's considered even today the world's worst industrial disaster, right? apart from maybe the BP uh, oil leak um, that happened a couple of years ago. So over 500,000 people were exposed to a lethal dose of methyl gas, um, and the substance made its way into the shanty towns in and around the plant. Uh, there were between four and 16,000 fatalities, but the more shocking figure is the 550,000 people subjected to various forms of life-changing injuries through poisoning. So this guy's lost his sight. The company, which was based out of Houston, Texas, responsible for upkeep of the plant, the Dow Chemical Company, was litigated in court, but it took until 2010 for that to happen, so nearly 30 years. Uh, an out-of-court settlement was agreed on for $450 million, but it took a long, long time, right? So these people were caught on the wrong side of a decision-making process. And my point is that you don't want to be left on the wrong side of that decision-making <coughs> process. So, citizens aiming to influence the decision-making process, and that makes active participation a good thing. Um, but I've defined active participation already more broadly than just voting. 
So, you've got a very strong body of theory that's associated with this, right? So, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 18th century, um, responsible for books such as uh, Emile, which is about education and about children, um, but a, a, a towering philosopher, right? Who, um, his fame has something to do with his coinage of the, of the term general will, right? So, um, I mean, I guess philosophy, like anything else, is uh, it's, it's partly about marketing, right? That if you can put an elegant phrase to something, then two of them, something years later, some people will be talking about you. And this is, a, this, is why, this is why I left Rousseau in the slide. This idea of the general will. Um, and people were talking about the general will in the disturbances of the French Revolution that happened uh, about 50 years after Rousseau came up with these ideas, right? And then uh, two, uh, two social scientists, uh, American social scientists, what were their names? Uh, Gabriel Almond and Sidney Berber, right, 1963. Uh, so civic culture is conducive to a stable democracy, right? Uh, and they define between parochial, subject, and participant cultures, all right? Uh, so the parochial, uh, citizens are only remotely aware of the presence of central government and live their lives near enough regardless of the decisions taken by the state, distant and unaware of political phenomena, right? And, and for this, your model might include, um, you know, this is famous, like, story that you might have heard about uh, peasants that were only about 100 miles out from Moscow, that when uh, Lenin's uh, forces arrived to collectivize agriculture, they weren't even aware that the Russian Revolution had happened. Now, they're not parochial subjects by any other factor than, you know, they live in a, a, a highly separated Russian culture of the early 20th century. They're not lazy, right, because they can't, they can't get to know. There's own newspapers and stuff, but Nevertheless, that's an example of the parochial political subject as defined by Armand and Berber, that people who are completely unaware, right, completely distant, cut off, disconnected. And then they define subject uh, where citizens are aware of central government and are heavily subjected to its decisions with little scope for dissent. Uh, the individual is aware of politics its actors and institutions, it is effectively oriented towards politics, which effectively, uh, with an A instead of an E, uh, would mean that there's some kind of um, agentic participation. Not a lot, but some, right? Uh, but it's on the downward flow side of politics, that it's the kind of, you know, like, so uh, fictional authors, right, distinguish between two types of character, people who make things happen and people who have things happen to them, right? And, I mean, this applies to people too. And these are people, the, 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 the subject subject, if you like, is the kind of person who, although they have some kind of agentic involvement, they're the kind of person that things happen to, not the kind of person that makes things <coughs> happen. And then, of course, the participant, um, exemplifies um, some of these late 18th century ideals, right? Even if they happen to be not the kind of human being that the late 18th century high-minded guys with wigs would have envisaged taking part in the political process, that these participant subjects are, um, they're all in, right? Um, I've got a friend like this, um, that I won't name him, but, but um, knew him from Warwick um, at various stages, and he's the kind of guy who gets out of bed every morning, and as well as doing whatever else he might be doing, he's fully participated, right? Up to and including debating who will ever take him on. He ended up debating the Vice-Chancellor of Warwick over the, um, over the Vice-Chancellor's pay um, when he was 18, right? So that, that's a participant. It actually, this guy actually exemplifies um, a model later on, I'll bring him up again. So that's Armand and Verba. So then, you've got somebody who um, I, I did hear about in my A-levels from that sort of surfer Marxist guy, right? Uh, Robert Putnam. <coughs> and Putnam lifts his idea of social capital, as I said, from Pierre Bourdieu, 
right, a, a, a 1960s French sociologist. But Putnam argues that people with social capital create by virtue of their interrelation and their interconnected <laughs> participation, uh, create what he calls a civic community. I mean, people, people have talked about civic community since the late 18th century, but civic community, right? And it creates strong, responsive, effective, representative institutions. Um, and I can play you, I can play you easily a, a, like a clip from something like the West Wing. If anybody's heard of the West Wing, where there's all these sort of high-minded segments by people uh, trying to get the young people out to vote, right? So this idea. Um, Robert Putnam actually wrote a better book than that 1994 book. So the 1994 book was called <coughs> Making Democracy Work in Garish Red and Green. Right? So he wrote a better book than that in 2000 that you might want to write down the name of. So I heard about this during my A levels and it's very good. Um, I've sort of pressed it, I've not read it. But it's very good. So the uh, name of the book is Bowling Alone. Right? And he takes, I'm sure he didn't use Simpsons as his model, but I'll use Simpsons to explain this, right? So Putnam's argument is that uh, this kind of civic community has always been in America, or had always been, very strong. And he uses as his model um, the tendency, like, so bowling, you know, with balls and a lane and pins and whatever, it's big in America, remains big in America. But he, uh, he uses as his model the idea that people used to bowl in teams, right? So they, they wouldn't go, you know, you wouldn't go with your girlfriend, boyfriend, you'd go in teams. So you, you, you may be people from your neighborhood. And if, I mean, we don't, I, see, I, I have seen people do this in the UK, but his point is that the, this, is, this was very strong in America. It's about a very uh, deeply embedded and resonant feature of American 20th century political culture, right? That people bowled in teams. And he said, um, he, he lamented that people were no longer doing that, right? That people were bowling alone. And this is the kind of, um, this is the kind of lament, if you like, that someone like Michael Moore mooches off now, right? If you know something about Michael Moore, that he, and I, and I do use that word mooches pejoratively in a sense, because he's, he's picking up on this, um, he's picking up on this sense of, something decaying about the American civic community that I'm sure that we've seen borne out recently in the election with the way that people have come to see each other antagonistically, oppositionally. But this was Putnam's idea that bowling alone in American culture meant something significant and we needed to pay attention to it. And he linked it, for example, to the Columbine thing, right? That more individuation uh, undermines, degrades civic community. So, the um, one way to counter the culture of bowling alone would be deliber uh, deliberative democracy. Um, so, deliberative democracy allows for open reason deliberation, mutual understanding, uh, common interest involvement, um, and the best example pedestrian, I suppose, but the best example I could think of was momentum within the Labour Party. But um, the picture that I was looking for, I couldn't actually find, so it's a little bit like that, but it's more like within a kind of, uh, like a political office, right? So Jeremy Corbyn is sitting in this easy chair, surrounded by people that you can see are kind of members of the public, right? So this deliberative democracy thing is happening within the Labour Party currently. To the extent that if I can find the uh, relevant piece of paper. So there's actually been, um, in response to this kind of deliberative democracy thing, right, calls within the Conservative Party for an equivalent institution. Uh, this is spearheaded by a, a guy at Durham University, he's graduated now, I think he's 21, called Tom Harwood, right? So he's, um, he was the chair of the uh, National Union of Students arm of the Leave campaign for Brexit. Um, and this guy, Tom Harwood, and as well as thousands of other young conservatives are saying, uh, so the slogan was, Theresa May isn't cool, right? So I actually think she's quite cool, but the idea is that you need something to energize, get people talking, 
right, in this kind of deliberative sense, um, that you open reason, deliberation, mutual understanding, common interest and involvement. Now, the, the practical issues, I suppose, coalesce around the idea, how do you translate the kind of deliberative model, which, as you know, goes all the way back to ancient times, it's, it, it's a perennial thing, right? Not only consultation, but active consultation and decision making that's influenced in some meaningful sense on the deliberative process. How do you translate that into where, where it's happening now? So a, a party of opposition, Labour, how do you translate that into government? Now, of course that's not impossible, right? And, and, and my brain isn't wired that way. I, I, I don't get involved in those kind of debates, I suppose, and so for me it seems, you know, not an unbridgeable chasm, but certainly a difficult political task, that how do you translate deliberative democracy into government? Not impossible, it could be done, but there are practical issues with it, right? That, that something of that deliberative ethos, probably even Corbyn would admit, would, would necessarily be lost once you get into government. Unless you want to fundamentally change the UK's political culture, which is what some young people are trying to do. Um, that, that if that happened, that embodiment of deliberative democracy as a feature of the decision-making process, if that happened, it would be because of more imaginative people than me. That just because I can't think of it, it doesn't mean it can't be done, but it's difficult. So, now we get on to people that... Uh, <coughs> not jive with me because these are two slightly different theses to mine but now we get on to the uh, the grumpy side of things right so you've got any of you I know there's quite a few people doing economics in this room so some of you probably know about Joseph Schumpeter right so he was the economist that coined the term creative destruction right so he's a very sort of cerebral guy that was capable of uh, wielding large abstract concepts and bashing them together and doing something with it that Schumpeter in 1943 said the typical citizen drops down to a lower level of mental performance as soon as he enters the political field. He argues and analyses in a way that he would recognise as infantile within the sphere of his real interests. He becomes a primitive again. Um, now, I've not put it up there, but if you, if, you, if you like and enjoy this sort of thing, this kind of cynicism about the crowd or about the political participant uh, is echoed in someone like Freud in a very interesting way. So Freud uh, looks at the crowd and the political participant with not Schumpeter's um, fiercely uh, clinical, cerebral kind of, you know, high, high enlightenment standards about rational faculties and all the rest of it. Freud's looking at it, of course, in a different way, but Freud echoes this kind of uh, cynicism and the suspicion about the political <coughs> participant and what they descend into, right, when they become political actors. And then you've got the kind of, uh, what you could call, I guess, the I can't be bothered thesis about why people don't participate or why people shouldn't participate through voting. Uh, Hebbing and Thais Moore, 2002, not far behind giving more power to selfish elites on the list of disliked political procedures is getting more personally involved, right? And this would be, I don't know, maybe this gravitates around something like shyness, laziness, complacency. But um, I'm tempted to build that into my thesis, I guess, about why a lack of political participation isn't problematic, right? Because one thing that the, the guys in the Whigs in the 18th century forgot if you like, they're the Jedi, right? So they're, they're, they've got this high-minded notion of how people can be, the morals to which they can adhere. Well, these guys sort of represent the dark side, right? So that they know in the way that someone like George Washington wouldn't, right? Because they knew that we're not all George Washingtons, right? That, that we are lazy, that we are complacent. That, and the funny thing is that the more successful and ambitious you get, the more aware you get of this, that, that the more successful you are, the more you're aware of your own laziness and complacency in various ways because you, um, you want to eradicate, you know, maybe, you want to eradicate every last bit of it, become more efficient. That someone like Bertram Russell wrote a whole book in praise of idleness, right, or complacency, whatever you want to call it. So that's a big part of things. 
So we'll go to a quick break. But the idea that I want you to think about for what's the time? Ten, ten two. Should we go for five minute break? Make it ten. Yeah, make it all right, so make it ten, so between five two and the hour. The question that I want you to think about is that um, if according to um, the people who preceded, if you like, what I call the grumpy theorists, if voting is so good, if the maintenance of an effective, strong civic community is so good, maintained by voting, where did everybody go? Why did they stop voting? I'll show you some graphs in a minute. Thank you. 